Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia, for that introduction. Thank you to Claudia and to Pia and to the entire Slavery and Dependency Research Team for this really generous introduction and invitation. Um, I'm also, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping uh, that this keynote actually connects um, with Suzanne Leto's talk um, as we're thinking together about kinship and family and race. My talk today uh, engages two broad themes that have emerged for me out of the project of writing Reckoning with Slavery. One concerns the nature of the 17th century archive for African and Afro-diasporic women, and the second concerns questions about the way in which the notion of the private coheres around the exclusion of those women from that very category. The first is a question of historiography, and the second is a question of knowledge formation. Um, both speak to a claim about what engenders change over time in the spaces of the modern and what manner of methodological stance we, we require in order to apprehend it. My own work and my interests continue to be located at the start of the early modern in the late 16th and early 17th century as the shift to new world colonialism and extractive economies takes hold. But what links my focus with the present is, as Catherine Hall argues, the conviction that slavery was, quote, never just about the economy, close quote, that it permeated the culture and politics of both metropolitan and colonial societies, and that attention to the histories of slavery enrich our understanding of the genealogy of the modern. In this regard, my interest in situating the history of privacy in tandem with histories of racialization and enslavement, both in England and the English colonies, and I apologize for you, to you all for that, but that's, that's where my work is. Um, and I hope, though, that it makes these connections across um, to the subjects that you all are concerned with. Um, uh, my interest in situating those histories um, together is an extension of, or perhaps a coda to, my research on numerous and kinship. It concerns the process by which an idea comes into being and the impact of the presence of black people on the formulation of that idea. It also, of course, concerns the impact of that idea on the black women who come to understand both the politics of their own location, in this case, their exclusion from the category of the private or the domestic in their own lives, even as their presence in the private lives of white people comes to contradictorily define white interiority and privacy, and that was a long sentence, but I hope it becomes clear as I talk, um, and the need to act to oppose it, so the, the refusal on the part of those women of African descent. When Claudia invited me to present uh, to the Slavery and Dependency Gathering, she said that she imagined that I might take up Angela Davis's 1971 reflections on the black women's role in the community of slaves, this uh, seminal article, and put that work into conversation with my own. I'm really grateful to you, Claudia, for that act of instigation, because it's caused me to carefully revisit work that was actually at the center of my own intellectual formation in the early 1990s, and that has shaped my own commitments to the history of black women ever since. Having said that, though, there are works that you read that kind of hover in the background and whose impact on you isn't always entirely clear. Davis's article is, um, is that kind of a work for me. What I've come to understand as I revisited it over the past few weeks is that my interest in the notion of privacy or domesticity owns, owes a considerable debt to the work that Angela Davis did to re-spatialize um, the living quarters of the enslaved. So Davis wrote, we can assume that in a very real material sense, it was only in domestic life, away from the eyes and whip of the overseer, that the slaves could attempt to assert the modicum of freedom they still retained. It was only there that they might be inspired to project techniques of expanding it further by leveling what few weapons they had against the slaveholding class, whose unmitigated drive for profit was the source of their misery. Um, via this path, we return to African slave women. In the living quarters, the major responsibilities naturally fell to her. From here, Davis went on, at least initially, to describe classic forms of care work that enslaved women would, as she put it, naturally have to assume. Feeding, clothing, nurturing children, being sexual companions to men. 
But for my purposes, I'm less interested in thinking about the materiality of what women did in the living quarters than I am interested in engaging the epistemological implications of what Angela Davis suggested. If we consider the origin of the antebellum living quarter, um, which was certainly what Davis was evoking, a kind of 19th century notion of the plantation economy, if we consider the origins of that space in the early modern period, we confront the complexity of Davis's intervention regarding the space of radical refusal. According to Shaniqua Roach, what Davis does here is to recuperate the living quarters as the area where basic needs of physical life were met, as a crucial space through which to potentially feel like one was, quote, among human beings again. In other words, the sort of act of, of attending to private life becomes a place of potentially radical refusal. Um, re refusing the, the supposition that people of African descent were not were not uh, uh, it were not did not have access to privacy did not have access to human human care and to and to structures of feeling. I find this formulation deeply generative, and the question of what living quarters, or as I gloss here and throughout my talk as privacy, might have meant to those whose lives were in the process of outlining the rationalist precepts of hereditary racial slavery, right? The women whose bodies were doing the work to say, this is where race is. And these children are not members of kin groups, but are in fact uh, uh, matters of capital. Um, that question of the, of the relationship of privacy to that process um, is at the core of the questions that I'm going to sketch today. So I'm going to begin with a very rudimentary overview of what it is that I mean when I use the term privacy or private life and how that category is embedded in ideas of kinship and in the opposition uh, between kinfolk and the market. And I'll then consider a kind of pastiche of a few things from the archive that are, that are, imposed, that are informing this project. Um, and as I do so, there are matters of methodology and narrative that I will highlight. And then I will return to the issue of the racialization of the public-private divide and to the methodological challenges that it poses for me. So this is not the time or the place for a deep dive into the scholarship on the public-private divide for women's and gender history. But briefly, um, I take as my starting point the role of that public-private divide in the creation and expansion of capital. Um, the work of Marx's supposition that, in the foundational words of Gail Rubin, under capitalism, a worker needs a wife, and a wife is a woman who does not inherit, does not lead, and does not talk to God. The emergence in the 19th century of what Nancy Cott defined as women's separate sphere is also foundational and underpins the scholarship on women's history that emerges in the late 1970s and 80s to examine how women's organizations challenged the boundaries between public and private spheres. In the context of African American women's history, those boundaries were deeply troubled by the racist American landscape in which black women were never afforded the prerogatives of private life, and indeed in which black families and households were a provocation to white supremacists who routinely and violently shattered black claims to private life, perhaps in part due to the unexamined degree to which their own claims to privacy, like those to citizenship, have always been subtended by the exclusion of black and brown people from the ideological spaces that their presence actually produces. As Christian Smith has most recently posited, quote, black women have never known the luxury of privacy in the Americas. Impossible privacy is one of the tormenting dimensions of slavery and its afterlife. This supposition is, for me, one of the, found, uh, the fundamental contradictions in modern life that I can't stop trying to unpick. How do we make sense of foundational categories and of freedom and citizenship when those notions were forged in and through the presence of those fundamentally defined as unfree? Further, in the context of, the, of North America and American U.S. history, how do we assess the impact of those people who Nicole Hannah-Jones has most recently trumpeted as foundational to the idea of freedom, the perfectors of American democracy, on a system whose will to exclude us only extends further and deeper as we move into the 21st century? <laughs> 
In any case, from these origins in women's and gender history, we are comfortably situated in an analytic frame in which the rise of capitalism and the production of surplus value is materially connected to the dichotomy posed by the domestic, the home, the private, in relationship to the public, the space of politics, commerce, and other masculinist pursuits. One in which the labor of women in households is redirected towards supporting the production of capital by the male members of that family who traverse the divide into public space, bolstered by a dominant ideology in which women as a class are oppressed. So that's like the, the sort of simple fundamental, right? Of course, as I've already said, for black people, even prior to the expansion of the colonies in the Americas, reproduction and family formation got and get situated always as part of public life. The public life of the slave owner or of the members of the whitening household in which those early black Europeans tended to labor. By this I mean a few things. First I mean that as black women, men, and children entered into European and then to American slave markets, their identity as members of families became dismantled. This is not, I argue, a byproduct or even a tool of their dispossession, but rather a key technology of their increasingly racialized enslavability. The reproduction of their status as slaves hinged on a decided shift in the nature of family formation and a denial of their fundamental and deeply human location in and as kin. Secondly, and simultaneously, the presence of black people in white households became part of the ideological denotation of the household and the family of the patriarch as private space. Over the course of the early modern period, across Europe and England, the culture of family would increasingly become to be defined by the presence of those designed to serve it. The notion of a servant as one of the family becomes a mainstay of middle and upper class domestic respectability at the same time that the family life of the domestic worker was fundamentally erased from the consciousness of those whose private life was defined by those erasures. Erasures are, for me, enormously provocative, as is the one embedded in the very word family. The etymological root of the family is the Latin um, famulus, or household slave. It signified a household in which both blood relations and laborers lived. Family, then, is etymologically rooted in the slave, whose presence initially marked it as both foreign and intimate, but whose presence also ultimately became part of what delineated the white patriarchal family as deserving of privacy and domestic space free from the marketplace. Um, as Urvashi Chakravarti writes, slavery is always philologically and intellectually central to how we must understand generation and nativity, kinship and bloodlines. If the family comes to register the sense of kindred and consanguinity and even of a race, the slave lies at the heart of the family, indeed is foundational to the family. Etymologically, one quite literally cannot have the family without slavery. If kinship then, dismantled by the marketplace, both produces hereditary racial slavery as legible to potential enslavers and demarcates their own families as firmly and indeed naturally beyond the reach of the commodifying processes of the market, this then is the entry point for my own commitment to thinking more carefully about if and how privacy is rooted in a 17th century or maybe even a 16th century notion of surplus production and the generation of domesticity that is both gendered and racialized. Scholars of women and gender in the 17th century have of course raised questions as to whether the notion of a public or private divide is actually a useful construct. Um, given the degree to which early modern families, um, the, the, given to the degree to which the areas of life that we usually identify as private or personal, family, religious beliefs, sexuality, were, as Erica Longfellow wrote, understood to have economic and communal resonances that made them much more um, than the business of individuals. In other words, there's a tension in the historiography about what, when this idea of the family as a private space comes into being. Um, but part of what I'm arguing or what I'm exploring is the, is the fact that as 
that that definitional space of the family as as a, a space that is um, antithetical to the market is coming into being. It's doing so at the very same time that Europeans are embracing racial slavery as a logical means to acquire um, economic power and um, strength in the in the uh, in the colonies in the Americas. Um, as I think about the ways in which the lives of English women across the spectrum of status and geography were defined by their movement in and out of literal marketplaces, buying and selling goods for and from their households, I am struck by the substantively different role that marketplaces played for women in the Black Atlantic. And I would like to think more carefully about the marketplace as a special and familial mark of delineation. Um, the ability to move in and out of the market that is so uh, foundational to a white woman's um, capacity to create private life for her family um, is one that is uh, fundamentally uh, denied to black women for whom the marketplace is only um, almost only a, a place of danger and potential family disruption. New scholarship on race in early modern English literature and culture fundamentally expands the arena, the kind of place of these questions. Work that argues for careful attention to the symbolic and material presence of black people in England and in early modern Europe well before the turn to slave societies that marked the later 17th century um, English and, uh, and other uh, uh, black Atlantics. Much of this burgeoning field influenced by the exceptional generative work of Ayanna Thompson and Kim Hall and their race before race formulation is concerned with how marks of servitude get like applied to the body, right? Like at what point does servitude become racialized? How do we understand the early moments in which the presence of black people in Europe began to meet an increasingly systematic way of thinking about what racial difference conveyed? Um, Imtiaz Habib's examination of the archives of blackness in England from 1500 to 1677 um, offers some important reflections on the connection between racialized difference and servitude that shape my own research questions. In the Elizabethan records, for example, more than half of the Africans whose lives touched the archives in London um, were women. Both women and men tended to work for merchants, those involved directly or indirectly in the 16th century trade with Africa and Iberia. A preponderance of them worked in the arena of textiles, whether for manufacturers, tailors, or seamstresses. Most Africans brought to England in the 16th and the 17th century ended up in domestic service. So already there's a there's an association with black bodies being in the households of the people who are going to increasingly become uh, associated with the kind of the mobility of the bourgeoisie and the, the, the capacity to define their households as private space. As Londoners were beginning to connect the notion of the growth of their wealth to overseas trade and that trade to both Africa and Africans laboring in the Americas, their material experiences with black people would connect black women with domestic service and labor in the intimate arena of the household of cloth and of clothing. The presence of those servants or slaves in London households carried a weight much heavier than their simple demographic record. Queen Elizabeth's warrant against blackamoors evoked a trope that redounds to this day, the accusation that too many black people were taking jobs and services that rightly belonged to the so-called Englishmen, playing on the fear of black servants overrunning English households, crowding out white subjects. So from the very beginning, there's this tension about what does it mean that there are black people in these households? The presence of black servants Increasingly ubiquitous, if not entirely common, in early modern English cities is made archivally evident in their efforts to leave that service. This is a sketch that comes from the mid 17th century of a black uh, female servant in an, in an English household. And I'd like you to remember the look in her eyes, because as Claudia mentioned, I'm very interested in the gaze of women who, um, whose attention caught uh, the whose whose own attention caught the attention of artists. Um, the runaway ad 
Okay, so the presence of black servants, um, uh, increasingly ubiquitous, if not entirely common, in early modern English cities is made archivally evident in their efforts to leave. Uh, the runaway ad, that fixture of colonial American newspapers and the efforts of colonial Americans to regulate the movement of um, both servants and slaves originates not in the Americas but actually in London. Simon Newman's examination of runaway slave advertisements in London's 17th century newspapers marks London and Londoners as fundamentally part of the development of transatlantic slavery as a culture of reading and writing and reporting. I will return to this. Um, the extent to which those ads produce an image of the absent black servant as undermining the stability of the London home is also part of the questions that I'm thinking about. There's a 20-year-old black woman, not this woman, but I am using her to help me think about what this might mean, who is marked with the brand of her capture on the West African coast, who ran away from the household in which she labored in late 17th century London. She was dressed the same way as other servants were when she ran, but that mark on her body, I think, means that she understood something quite different about her location. As she breached the boundaries of the domestic space in which she labored, she bore the mark of her enslavement on her body in ways um, more than just the brand that was burned into the flesh of her back. So we're about halfway through. <laughs> um, in Reckoning with Slavery, I contemplate the intersecting material and ideological arenas of value, race, kinship, and refusal in the early modern Atlantic. I'm trying to think through gender slavery and the early modern origins of capitalism there through an examination of race and numeracy. And I do so with an eye towards finding women, oh, here we are, this is the section now, um, finding women who know, women who catch your gaze, women who trouble your understanding of privacy, race, and refusal. I look for her across a range of sources that are literally designed to keep her obscure. Um, the edicts of royal rulers who declare their lands to be no home to blackamoors. Um, that's Queen Elizabeth. Uh, visual art uh, or material um, uh, objects that mobilize the presence of these same men and women to demarcate Europeans' homes and families and to ascribe their status and worth as tied to the luminescence of their skin. I turn also to runaway advertisements on both sides of the Atlantic. And of course, this is from a, a, an, an English paper in 1705. Um, and of course, I turn to the account books, the ledgers, the inventories, and bills of sale in which I think we're much more accustomed to finding her. The difficulty of the sources is just part of the work, and it demands a stance towards the archive, which many scholars steeped in critical histories of race are well aware of. The works of Hortense Spiller, Saidia Hartman, Catherine McKittrick, Taya Miles, Marisa Fuentes, all form the backbone for my own engagements thus far and continue to fuel my efforts going forward. So what follows here in the second half of my talk this afternoon are some pieces of evidence that I offer to you today in the spirit of a conversation about methodology, critical black history and historiography, and historicizing the intersections between race and privacy in the service of clarifying the epistemology of the living quarter. I'll begin quite far away from England or the English Atlantic world. Um, the first sub-Saharan African person to enter the archives of transatlantic slavery was a woman taken in a Portuguese raid in 1441 at the Rio de Oro in Senegambia. Aside from the fact of her capture, nothing further is known of her or what her captors imagined they had accomplished by seizing her. Still, she represents an origin story of sorts, of the slave trade, of the presence of women as victims of that trade, and of the impossibility of knowing more about her. Um, her obscurity is, of course, a reflection of how she comes into being for us. 
she is rendered into an abstracted note of value. Um, a mark on a ledger book, bereft of her context, her language, her gesture, her history, her kin. She was, of course, something much more. She was the beginning of something unspeakable in its wrenching of private life into the market, of indeed defining the notion of the private for some through the gesture that gets codified by the slave trade again and again. We are not them. That's the, that's the gesture of what happens in the marketplace. She is soon joined by others, the first large group of captive Africans, more than 250, who are sold at the southern port of Lagos in Portugal in 1444. Now, in Reckoning with Slavery, um, I repeatedly return to this episode in the 1453 Chronicles of the Discovery and Conquest of Guinea from the Portuguese writer um, Gomez de Zurara. While the manuscript circulated only minimally in the 15th century, it wasn't discovered and published until the 19th century, I find it to be a compelling window onto how Portuguese courtiers and sailors and presumably the elite readers who Zorada anticipated to be his audience understood the emerging phenomenon of racial slavery. I believe it speaks directly to the questions that are at the heart of the matter, both for me as a scholar of the early modern Atlantic world and as someone profoundly invested in connecting the reiterated of anti-black violence of today with its origins. So the passage exists in a longer text that describes a number of incursions made by the Portuguese along the shores of the area we now know as Senegambia. Um, I contend that Zurada's description of this first sale of a large group of African captives to European buyers demands this repetitious return because it is laden with clarity concerning the depth and the location of violence and despair that this act of commodifying human beings inaugurates. Indeed, it names the abstraction that is at the heart of its inaugural power. So uh, Zorada attempted to capture the grief of the 250 African captives who were unloaded on the deck. He writes, though we could not understand the words of their language, the sound of it right well accorded with the measure of their sadness. But to increase their suffering still more, there now arrived those who had charge of the division of the captives and who began to separate one from another in order to make an equal partition. And then was it needful to part fathers from sons, husbands from wives, brothers from brothers. The mothers clasped their other children in their arms and threw themselves flat on the ground with them, receiving blows with little pity for their own flesh, if only they might not be torn from them. He describes the anguish, then, of the division of the captives. The crew severing bonds of kinship in order to group the men, women, and children in equal lots to be sold. Lots characterized by abstract prices, not by their connection to one another. The sale of these women and men and children happened in the wide open public space of the dock in a bright midday afternoon amidst a gathering of Portuguese consumers, both those buying this new species of property and those who perhaps just aspired to do so. And thus we have the first recorded moment of recognition that motherhood and the marketing of human beings for sale would together prove to be the foundation of the Atlantic world. Or, put another way, that kinship and commerce would be inextricable for Africans and their descendants, even as they were increasingly antithetical for Europeans. Those whose bonds of kinship would not be subjected to dissolution in the marketplace in the way that would characterize the vulnerable abilities of Africans and their descendants. As those women threw themselves flat on the ground to protect their children, trying to fortify a living quarter with their own body, were they not enacting a foundational act of recognition, an act of knowing, a desperate effort to construct a literal space of safety through which they might preserve a modicum of privacy and decency? There are a number of things that feel significant to me in, in Zorada's text. For me, the most important one is the opposition set in motion by the language of commerce as um, opposed to that of kinfolk. This is part of an, of an enlightenment transformation of knowledge, what Sylvia Winter calls the de-godding, um, in which early modern formulations of commerce and trade subtend the emergent language not just of race as a corporeal trait, but also the related concepts of racial hierarchy that made the trade in human beings appear to be rational. Mm -hmm. 
By rational, I mean to evoke the collections of presumptions that coalesce around concepts, concepts of trade, accounting, currency, and value that increasingly came to define the boundaries between the affective and the calculable the space of feeling and the space of rational marketing, the space of the home and the space of the market. Um, thus, Zorada's language of division and equal partitions that are, that are uh, mobilized in opposition to fathers, mothers, sons, and wives conveys more than hereditary enslavement's essential conflict between market and kin. It also marks the essence of what is at the root of the transatlantic slave trade and that which follows in its wake. The simultaneous reliance upon the simultaneous reliance upon hereditary notions of enslavability with the refusal to accord Africans the prerogative of family. This is something that I've written about rather extensively, but its connection to the problem of private life, to its impossibility for Africans and their descendants, feels really urgent and also elusive to me. So when I first wrote this um, in May, I was writing in the immediate aftermath of the mass shootings in the United States that happened in Buffalo, New York. And I asked, is the supermarket a domestic space? Is the wrenching anguish I felt that week looking at the faces of black women and men dead while shopping for a weekend supper or a grandson's birthday cake, is that an extension of the home invasions that have characterized black life in the wake for generations? This week, as Americans are reeling in the aftermath of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, I wonder about the precedent set hundreds of years ago by hereditary racial slavery. Did it open up a space of possibility that reverberates both in the lives of black women and women more generally? If a nation state's beginnings are rooted in the seizure of black women's reproductive capacity, has that set in motion a material and ideological space in which the state's interest in regulating reproduction is normalized and indeed codified? Is the call for reproductive justice an extension of abolition? Those are some things that are on my mind this week. So, the foundational intervention of African American women's history made by Hazel Carby, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, Darlene Clark Hine, was that African American women's inability to have and to protect private or domestic life from the violence and state policy of white supremacy, in fact, propelled not just an articulation of black womanhood, but a politics of it. This politics is at the heart of black life in what Christina Sharp names the wake, um, and at the core of the origins of black radicalism. But also, to continue to evoke Sharp, the work of the wake, of simultaneously being in a perpetual state of mourning, while simultaneously being wide awake to its structural source. For my purposes, the exclusion of black women from the space and the category of domesticity, interiority, and privacy is what frames my archival work. I am taken aback by what Zurara acknowledges. He says he could not understand the measure of his sadness. He did. He just, oh, he just chose to turn away. So let me now jump briefly to the other side of the Atlantic, side, sidestepping the histories of the development of slave societies with which everyone in this room is familiar, and return to the runaway advertisements. The ads offer glimpses of women who's, who fully understood their location and whose efforts to produce or protect their family life, their privacy, thrust them into the documents that are actively producing imagined publics, right? So the newspaper is producing a collection collective public identity, but the women of African descent who we find in the newspaper are trying to protect, are, are trying to, or have, are enacting their own sense of protecting their private identity. So this is an ad um, that comes from, uh, from New Jersey in 1771. Um, a woman who has been captured and escaped from jail evokes something very complicated. She, it, it says, among other things, that from the jail she was reported to have made an escape and two months ago was discovered about 15 miles from Ballfriars Ferry in Fredericks County in Maryland where she had three children. So she, is, she has run away, she's been captured, she's escaped, she's reconnected with her children. Um, for Violet, uh, 
this woman whose name is Violet, gone for more than seven years. Her ties to family, the man James Locke and her three unnamed children have deepened during the years of her migratory moves from Pennsylvania to Maryland, the crisis of death and sale, the catalyst for her escape, the children an anchor for her and a tantalizing source of wealth for the white man who persists year after year after year in making his claim to her despite her successes at eluding him. She has carved out a tenuous home um, through fugitivity, one that amplifies through her rather exceptional circumstances a far more quotidian conflict between enslavement and the desire to preserve a space that might be seen as domestic or private, quarters for living rather than for dying. That her fugitivity made her an outlaw is of course fitting. I'm always interested in the intersection between intimacy and violence, between the ownership of children by slave owners and the counterclaims made by the women who mothered them. These children embodied the contradictory reality of family formation that lies at the heart of the structural logic of slavery, the ways in which women's bodies lay at the fulcrum of hereditary racial slavery, and thus contained a deeply intimate contest over the contours of their private life. So here's a woman named Sarah um, who ran away from Trenton, New Jersey, a likely mulatto slave um, who has now changed her name to Rachel. She took her son with her, a mulatto boy named Bob, about six years old, who has a remarkable fair complexion with flaxen hair. She's a lusty wench, about 34 years of age, big with child, she's pregnant again, and has on a striped linsey petticoat and a linen jacket. As I read this text, I think that Rachel has determined that she will not bear another remarkably fair complected child with flaxen hair, and instead has chosen a husband who fights in the war, because that's where she's headed. One whose paternity will carry a different remarkable cast. I don't know, of course, I could be wrong. But the call to family, intimacy, and privacy that pressed upon this woman, big with child, who has renamed herself, perhaps in a gesture of Old Testament acknowledgement that she is fully able able to conceive, like Rachel, is the recognition that her children are not safe at Trenton Ferry and that further south they may very well be. This is of course a recurrent act, um, aspect of slavery in the Atlantic world, one that we see reverberating in plantations, urban work sites, and households whenever the demand of labor clashed with the ties of kin, the threat of sale, the stealing of oneself. But I want to read these snatches of women's lives also as a bricolage for a theory of interiority and of politicized knowledge formation. In the passage that I've quoted from Zurata's Chronicles, um, as well as in these runaway ads, while we see the incursion of the marketplace into the vulnerability of family, we also see in the starkest possible terms the intensity of African refusals to comply with the marketplace's debilitating impact on their ties to one another, and thus the core human, the core challenge that human cargo posed for Europeans. How to cause the logic of commerce to do away with the affective space of kinship, something that of course could never be accomplished. So I posit that Cedric Robinson would have called this part of the origin of the black radical tradition, this petit marinage, this um, act um, on the part of women to parent, um, to understand uh, what their pregnancy or their lack of pregnancy meant in the marketplace. This effort to claim ontological totality. I, I recently, in the Partis article, named it an early modern black women's political economy. When I did so, I meant to capture uh, the critical understanding on the part of these women um, of the of I meant to capture their understanding of the economy in which they found themselves. But I don't think that that term did justice to what I intended. Instead, I think I need to shift away from a theoretical framework in which the insertion of economic understanding, right, by which I mean the realization that one's reproductive body is firmly cemented to the market and to the market aspirations of a person whose racialized separation from you is produced in, those al in the alchemy of those aspirations. Um, I want to move away from this idea that an economic understanding stands in for the evidence of like legitimate intellectual action. Um, I have long been concerned that we approach the history of gender and slavery through a prism that only searches for like women's feeling 
right? Um, I want to think more carefully about what understanding the intersections of gender and slavery might mean for us. Um, because that gesture is mired in a methodology that directs us away from reckoning with intellect. What did these women know? What kind of politics and political economy were they creating? I see women's reproductive capacities, their proximity to the foundational destruction that hereditary claims to enslavability makes as producing more than grief. Um, I think those claims produced um, evasive strategies in which the clarity about newly emerging structures of thought are encoded. Um, one of which was the clearly exclusionary and indeed violently narrow idea of who gets to claim domestic space. But the problem of asserting this is both evidentiary and conceptual. And it is here that I reach for the scholars who have always helped me to think. It's impossible to approach the histories of slavery and gender without confronting the problem of the archive. No one showed us this more starkly than Angela Davis, writing with little access to even printed material from prison, and yet doing so with a clarity of purpose and a refusal to look away from the structures of confinement that connected her life to those of the 19th century women she wrote about. She understood, perhaps fiercely so, that the archival interests of the state are always at cross purposes to the lived experiences of those whose labor undergirds its power and wealth. The process by which accounts of court, trade, commerce, and government came to be archived is the same one that ends with no accounting at all for the lived experiences of 17th century African women and their descendants. As Marisa Fuentes, is that what I have here? Nope, sorry. <laughs> As Marisa Fuentes, um, has generatively shown we must understand that enslaved women appear through the form and content of archival documents in the manner in which they lived, spectacularly violated, objectified, disposable, hypersexualized, and silenced. Fuentes' observations are foundational. Before we received these women, they were, of course, captured by the Atlantic market through a set of ideas and practices that enabled the damage white people did to them and ensured that such damage could only result in archival obscurity. Um, in an article on the slavevoyages.org uh, data set, uh, published in the spring, the journalist Jamil Bowie wrote in the New York Times that it's paramount that we keep the truth of the essential humanity of the enslaved at the forefront of our efforts, lest we recapitulate the objectification of the trade itself. In other words, we have to be very careful as we think about the um, about the, 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 the numerical records, the records of trade, and how those records are designed um, to set aside the possibility of knowing, the possibility of consciousness, and the possibility of extended and, um, and uh, extensive opposition. The women with whom I am concerned were always um, generating responses to the profoundly new circumstances that were unfolding around them. These circumstances included their firm displacement outside the category of the private, even as the forces that brought them into archival materiality were propelled by the desire to protect that which is associated with the private, intimacy and family. Um, my supposition builds on the arguments that I have made around probate records in, la in laboring women. There, I argued that when crafting a last will and testament, a slave owner who reached into a black woman's reproductive future, assigning her as yet unborn offspring to his heirs, was involved in some fairly obvious speculative phantasms, but was also delineating his children as unenslavable by mobilizing hers, who were infinitely so, even those who had yet to be conceived. Similarly, the preponderance of the relatively small number of black women and men in England who served in elite homes, whose status was demarcated in portraitures, became part of the plans laid out by aspiring planters and their reluctant wives. Men like Richard Ligon, who idealized plantations, um, whose idealized plantation included 50 men and 50 women, or other plantation planners who always had these kind of balances um, to, to sex ratio as a way to say this business of making families um, into commodity is at the core of what Atlantic slavery is going to be.
the careless pairing um, alongside collective inventories for both petticoats and trousers are not unexpected, but I think they do something more than simply situate women as laborers and as the site of economic growth. They suggest a set of ideas about who does and doesn't have domesticity, who does and doesn't have privacy, um, and where the boundaries of the public and private will sit in the so-called new world. So I have one final thing to share with you, very short. Um, in 1638 in Boston, in a large household situated on a thousand acres of land on an island in the harbor, a couple named Samuel and Amias Maverick enslaved two African women and a single man. Samuel ordered the man to rape the older of the two African women so as to enrich his family through her pregnancy. A visitor chronicled the aftermath of her rape, saying she, quote, cried loud and shrill to him, who, like Zurara, could not understand her language, but who could understand her grief. A grief no doubt amplified by the intimacy of the household in which she labored and the clarity she must have understood in her bones that Amias Maverick, the, the wife, um, and her daughters were not just protected in their own domestic space, but that the unnamed woman's rape for the express purposes of breeding more slaves for the Mavericks was in fact part of what defined the Maverick's private life. It defined their household. Does it matter to this unnamed woman that the year she was raped in Boston was the very year that King Charles I's council at Westminster declared that, quote, England was too pure an air for slaves to breathe in, close quote? No, not at all. Does it matter to us? The simultaneity of denial and evidence of slavery's saturation into even the most intimate space of both English and black life? The eruption into domestic quarters of the most public aspiration for racial dominance? I think it should. Thank you. Thank you.